you deserve the glory. I grab hold of you with my all. I'm holding on to you with my all. For from you is everything, and to you is everything. You deserve the glory. Jesus, Jesus. Well, Heavenly Father, you do deserve the glory, all of the glory, Father God. And so, Lord, tonight, as we just continue to press into what you have for us tonight, Lord, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, Jesus. For you're the only one worthy, Jesus. You're so worthy. You're worthy of our glory, Jesus. You're worthy of our honor, Jesus. Jesus, you're so good. Jesus. Jesus. And so, Lord, have your way in this room tonight, Jesus. As you have already, Father God, we pray more in Jesus' name. More, Lord, in Jesus' name. More anointing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. More truth in Jesus' name. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. If you're still being ministered to by the Lord, you can stay right where you are. No worries. No worries at all. God's going to continue to minister to you in big ways, right? <clears throat> Everybody doing all right tonight? Everybody feel the spirit of the Lord in this place? I mean, you pretty much got to be dead if you haven't. I mean, seriously, really, if you haven't felt the Lord on you, you're... you're you may want to check a heartbeat. Um, you know, uh, tonight we're going to be starting a, a, a series, a four-week series, and, and, and really, tonight's going to be the beginning of, of a series of probably the most, hear me, the most significant event known to mankind. Of course, you already know the answer. So what I'm going to be preaching on, we're going to be talking about the cross of Christ. Now, of course, we are a Christian church and, and everybody knows the cross and, 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 you know, we come under the authority of the cross and we have the cross in our life. And, and many of us have been taught um, these passages of scripture that we're going to be looking at over the next four weeks. But here's the thing. There's clearly five significant identifiable events in the life of Christ, but none so impactful as the event of the cross. When I talk about the cross and the event of the cross, I'm talking about the beating, the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Although, like I mentioned already, I believe it's one of the most significant events of human, human history. I also believe it's one of the most misunderstood and unbelieved events in human history, even to the Christian. And that's sad. So over the next four weeks, I hope and pray that... I will clearly communicate the cross of Christ in such a way that you will not only know it, you'll consider it, you'll present, and you'll walk in the Spirit, empowered to believe it and appropriate it through faith in your life. It's difficult where to start in a series like this, and so I'm, I'm going to start in a probably an unlikely place, and then kind of back around and, and we'll see what the Lord has to um, 
has to do in it all. But I'm going to start in Galatians, in Galatians uh, chapter 2. If you have a Bible handy, it's awesome that you would have it and, and uh, look at it in your own um, version if you don't use the Elite Standard Version. Um, the <clears throat> Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it's a, it's a verse that many of us probably can quote just like that. And my question is, awesome that you can quote it, but do you believe it? And that's really where the rubber meets the road. And so in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So what really happened at the cross? What happened at the cross of Christ? Without going into some long discussion of what happened at the fall of mankind in the garden, I will just, just simply say that Adam rebelled. Adam rebelled against God and chose to eat of the tree of good and evil as opposed to life. Now, when you really begin to dig into this, there is one reason that Adam and Eve were hanging out at the tree of good and evil as opposed to the tree of life, because at the tree of life, they would never have had any knowledge of good and evil, and they would have had to completely rely on God. And so, as you know, if you've been a Christian for very long, they uh, rebelled against God. And we, mankind, have been paying the price ever since. Because we are all children of Adam being born, and, and I'm using specific phraseology here so you understand, and it'll, it'll unpack as we, as we go through not only tonight, but the other next four or three weeks. I'm using specific phraseology. Because we were born, um, we are all children of Adam being born in Adam. We were born with a sin nature alienated from God, and condemned. All of us. Anyone who's ever sucked the breath of air from the fall till now has been born in Adam. So, God, being that loving God that he is, he shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us on that cross. Now, it's important for us to recognize that there's two. I, I spent a tremendous amount of time in Romans. I've, I've spent a tremendous amount of time in Romans. I continue to spend a tremendous amount of time in Romans. And I will probably spend a lot of time in Romans in the future. It's a very, very influential book. I encourage you to. To study it, but there's two parts to the to to the book of Romans, especially in the first section. There's a part from Romans chapter one to uh, Romans chapter four twenty five uh, that that deals with um, the sins, the verb, and then from from chapter five all the way through to the end of eight. It primarily deals with sin in a noun form. And so it's, it's very interesting as you begin to un, uh, unravel what Paul's been talking about and what Christ did on the cross. And we know that on the cross, there was so much more that happened than just a brutal death of a Galilean man. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at this knowing. We're going to try and touch on it tonight in the time that we have left. But here's the thing that, that I've come to a personal understanding in my own personal walk, and I see it in literally almost everyone that I minister to. There's a certain uh, amount that, that um, 
you know, if we've professed Christ for very long and, and profess to be a Christian, we understand that the Word of God is, is our truth, and, and we take a hold of it, and it's very dear to us, and it should be, but we often don't believe it. And that's really where the rubber meets the road here at the cross. Do you actually believe what happened at the cross? Or is, ju- is it just ev- an event that happened 1,991 years ago, April 4th? Do you believe what the Bible says about what happened? Or like I mentioned earlier, was it just some joker hanging on a cross? I hate that luck. And there were two other jokers beside him. Do you know what what the cross of Christ has done for you? Friends, I'm telling you that there's more than you think. It's more than you have been experiencing. And my prayer tonight is that you only come to the, you not only come to an intellectual knowledge, but you come to an experiential knowledge. And there's a difference. There's a difference between the, intellectual knowledge, we can read our Bibles and we can say, hey, the Bible says this. But have we actually encountered and experienced this in our lives? There's a big difference there. Jesus' last words from the cross that day was it was finished. Remember, you know, I mean, many of you have read that passage of scripture. He's on the cross. He, he you know, they give him, uh, you know, kind of like some type of sour wine drink. He, you know, on a, he takes a little sip off of a sponge and, and basically says, it is finished. And the scripture says that, you know, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the temple veil rent from top to bottom, uh, a piece of, fabric 15 feet wide 40 feet tall and approximately five feet or excuse me five inches thick rent from top to bottom like a telephone book being tore by one of those big muscle guys just is symbolizing that now we have complete access right romans chapter 5 verses 1 through 5 that we have complete uh, peace with Christ, and we have complete access into the Holy of Holies. We don't have to go to a priest or a pastor. Uh, we don't, because because we are one. We can go into the Holy of Holies. One of the things that we we look at when we talk about the cross of Christ, and many people, although they say it and although they know it, I'm not sure many of us really truly believe it, but the blood that was shed on Calvary was shed for your sins. Your sins and my sins. And the important part, Brian, is that it's all and every. It's it's an important distinction. All and every, right? Because us humans, we, you know, you know, Corley's sin is much worse than my sin. Oh my gosh. You know what I mean? But but not to God. Because Jesus covered all and every. Now, in my own human mind, you know, I like to think that my sin isn't as bad as the child molester's sin. Right? I went to Medellin, didn't I? My sin isn't as bad as the 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 you know the one that practices the, the evil religion. Or even worship Satan. But Jesus, hear me, Jesus died for them too. It's hard to reconcile in our human minds, but he loves his creation that much. I want to pick it up in a a passage of scripture that I'm not sure that many of us are familiar with. It's in Romans chapter, in Romans chapter five. Of course, we're familiar with Romans chapter five, but I'm not sure we camp, we've ever camped out a lot on in 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 this passage. And and so I want to I want to read this passage of scripture uh, 
make a comment and then I want to ra- go right into another passage of scripture. And I messed up the order, Miss Marley. So you'll have to try and pay attention for me um, when I put uh, when I give it to you to put in. In Romans chapter five, I want to pick it up in verse twelve. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that one man obviously being Adam, okay, the death through sin, and so death spread to all men. Ladies, you're included. This is mankind. Because all sin, because, excuse me, because all sinned. Now, and I'll unpack this later, but we have to understand, why did we sin? Because we were sinners. And that's what sinners do. You see, the sin doesn't make us a sinner. We're already a sinner. What do sinners do? The byproduct of a sinner is they sin. Verse 13, it says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. The one to come was Jesus. Now, this is all going to make sense when I read this this passage and then the next passage, and it'll kind of put the two together and, and then try to unpack it for you. It's a little complicated, but it, it, it's the Lord's going to help me. And so in verse 14, it says, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the, have the grace of God and the f- free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses, brought justification. Do you see the difference? What brought Adam's condemnation? One sin. One sin. The sin of rebellion. Brought one one condemnation. Now think about this for a moment. Think about, just for a moment, every sin that you've ever done from the time that you've sucked the breath of air. Now, you've probably forgot about most of them, but I bet you if you can make a list, it'd probably be more than a full scat page long, Brian. But look what the scripture says. But the free gift followed many trespasses, brought justification. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how many sins you've committed. You have the ability to be justified before God the Father. You have the ability to have peace. Hear me, the work is already done. Verse 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive, key word, the abundance of grace, and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Women too. So what is this passage of Scripture saying? It's saying that on the cross, Jesus made a way for every man and woman and child to be justified before God, the Father, to have peace with him. That 
the, and we, we won't go here a whole lot, but the, the, the blood of Christ was the atonement for the sins that covered all of our sin debt. It paid our sin debt, so to speak. And it covered all of our sins. The, the, the past sins, the, the present sins, and the future sins, it covered them all. All is all. All and every. Now, here's the thing. We can believe, listen, we can believe a lot of different things, and we can look on YouTube and find a hundred different ways. Read the scripture. Most of us in the room, almost everyone in the, everyone in the room well, maybe I'm not sure about this young lady here, how old she is, but everyone in the room has a sixth grade reading level. That's what the scriptures was written on, a sixth, a sixth grade reading level. What is it saying there? It says, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous, right? For all men. For as, as by, excuse me, let's go up, back up to 19. It says, for, for as the one man, uh, man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Well, we can agree with that, right? But can we agree with the other? So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass but where sin increased, grace abound all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, when you take this passage of scripture and you couple it with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to pick it up in verse 45. There's two important distinctions here and titles that are given to Christ. And they're really, really important for us to understand because it answers the problem that happened 1,991 years ago. I'm going to keep saying that number and I want it honed into your mind by the end of the night. 1,000. 991 years ago. In verse 45, it says, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Who's it talking about? Well, the first Adam is Adam. But the last Adam is Christ. Let me continue. He became the life-giving spirit. Verse 46. But it is not, not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. So Adam came first, right? The first Adam. And the last Adam. The last Adam is Christ. The spiritual. Verse 47. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have bore the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So understand what, the, what happened at the cross. The first Adam messed up. The first Adam rebelled against God. And from that day forward, humanity without Christ has been at enmity with God the Father. Everybody follow on me? I know this is really teachy, but it's, it's really important kind of setting up the rest of the series. So... The last Adam was Christ. And when he went to the cross, he took all of Adam with him to the cross.
The first man was Adam. The second man was Christ. Why is that important? Because Adam established his race in rebellion. The second man established his race in obedience. The first Adam messed it all up. The last Adam took it to the cross and paid the price for it. You see, we need the blood of Jesus for forgiveness of sins, right? Because without blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, right? I preached a sermon series just a little bit ago on the blood of Christ. And so we need the blood for forgiveness of sins, but we need the cross of Christ for deliverance. You see, what we have here going on is that, as I mentioned at the start, in the first portion of Romans 1, uh, chapter 1 um, through 425, it's talking about sins, a verb, our actions, the sins, the, 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 the actions. But from 5 on, it's talking about the noun, person, place, or thing. It's talking about the person. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7 where there's not only something, you know, and we can all relate with Romans chapter 7, right? Everybody loves to read Romans chapter 7 and they say, amen, amen, right? Oh man, Paul's so relatable to me right now. Well, yeah, there's a couple things we need to understand about Paul in Romans chapter 7. He was completely self-absorbed with 24 eyes in 14 verses. If you're completely self-absorbed, guess what? You're going to have the same problem that Paul had. You're going to be struggling with doing what is right when you know what's right. At the inner being, at your inner core, where Jesus is, you want to do what's right, but you allow your flesh to rule you as opposed to the spirit. You see, here's the thing. The blood can wash away the sins, but it can't wash away the old man. The old man's got to be crucified. There's only one way to deal with the old man, James. Kill him. Pastor Lee and I used to joke when we first started out, and you know we don't do this anymore, so you know we've grown and matured a little bit. But when we first started out, we uh, I had. <laughs> Anybody knows me, they know that I'm uh, a person that, that likes firearms. And, and so um, I, I had some bullets in my pocket one day, and I just took them out, and I put them on my desk at, my, at the desk at church. And, and so we were doing something, and I opened up my drawer, and there's some 38 rounds in the drawer. And, and somebody says, man, what, you know, kind of, whoa, whoa, what, what are those for? And, and, and jokingly, jokingly, let me say it again, jokingly, we would say, well, here's what we do. We get people saved and then we shoot them so they don't mess it up. <laughs> here's the thing. By birth, hear me now, by birth, we were made sinners. The only way we can deal with the sinner is to kill it. The only way we can deal with the sinner is kill it. Here's the thing. The blood can wash away the sins, but it cannot wash away the old man. It needs the cross to crucify it. The blood deals with the sins, but the cross deals with the sinner. We got to have both. We got to appropriate both in our lives. We have to understand that the job, the work has been done. It's been done 1,991 years ago. All that sin has been paid for on the cross 
1,991 years ago. Hear me. You were crucified 1,991 years ago. Tell me I'm lying. Come on. My bot says that I was crucified with Christ. Now, I got saved. I try, you know, and, and some people will go, man, if you don't know the actual day, you can't be saved. Well, I don't know the actual day. But I claim that I'm saved, so I'm going by faith. I don't care what you say. But here's what, here's what happened. The day that I gave my life on the floor, 10 minutes earlier than that, Christ didn't come down from heaven and climb back up on the cross. When I took the knee and gave my life, I appropriated what he did 1,991 years ago. The job has been done. The question is, do you know it? Do you know it? Do you know that the cross of Christ has done it all? Or are you still trying to get in Christ? Are you still trying to get in Christ so that you can be crucified? Well, I want to give you some good news. It's, it's, it's really good news. Turn with me, if you've got a Bible handy, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's a small verse, and we're only going to look at, well, actually, I think I give you, I give you three verses, didn't I? 29. <clears throat> Let me pick it up in verse 29. So that no human may, uh, may be, so no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, Jesus, let me say it again, because of him, Jesus, you are in Christ. You didn't do a thing. You're already there. If you've appropriated forgiveness, if you count yourself saved, if you have faith for salvation, you're already in Christ. You don't have to get yourself, you don't have to maneuver to get in Christ. You're already there. Christ did the work for you. The question is, will you appropriate it in your life? Are you still trying to figure it out? Oh, here's what we do. You ready? This is how silly this is. Imagine this bottle of water for a moment, if you will. It has the ability to pray. Oh, Jesus, I'm just coming to you. I'm asking you, Jesus, make me a bottle of water. Make me a bottle of water. And fill me full of water. Cap me with a white cap. And then wonder why the prayer is not getting answered. It's already a bottle of water. It's already full. It's already got a white cap. Christ puts you in himself. At the cross. Christ died for every sin that you will ever commit. Christ not only died for your sins, he died and paid the price and broke and set you free from sin. Or, or excuse me, noun. He sets you free from sin. You are no longer, listen, I know there's been, many of y'all have been brought up in different denominations, and that's cool. But here's the thing. Are we going to read the Bible and believe what it says? Or are we going to believe what's, what, let, read it for yourself, man, woman. The Bible says that Jesus paid for all and every sin. The Bible says that Jesus, on the cross, sets you free from the reign of sin in your life. 
So if you're struggling with sin, it ain't Jesus' fault. He's already paid the price. He's already set you free. See, here's the problem is that when we come to Christ, when we come to Christ and we appropriate only by faith the blood, but we don't appropriate the cross, we have all kinds of issues. We have all kinds of issues. Because here's the thing. I'm saved, but because I'm saved, I know how wretched I was. And so the enemy has all kinds of accusations to throw at you. And you have all kinds of availability to believe his accusations because they're true. Because we don't know what we don't know. Well, how can you know? How can you know? Because God said so? Good enough for me. I don't know. What I'm staking my salvation on because God said so. God said, if I believe, I'll be saved. If I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, I will be saved. I just took him at his word. God said that Jesus took on the last Adam, took it to the cross, became the second man to give us a new race in righteousness. That's what the Bible said. I'm just going to believe what he said and then try to appropriate it in my life as, as best I can as I walk out in maturity in Christ Jesus. You see, many of us, we know this passage of Scripture. I know that in this church, we've probably been here at least a hundred times over the last three years. Second, and it's a very familiar passage of Scripture in, in Second Corinthians chapter 5. We all know where I'm going. I want to go first to, and I didn't give this to you, Marley, so don't stress. Uh, I want to go in verse 14, 514. It says, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, oh, all have died. So if you're appropriating Christ for salvation, I got some great news for you, and I got some bad news for you. Every time I ask that question, most people want the bad news first. So the bad news is you're dead. The good news is you're dead. The question is, do you believe it? And before you shake your head yes, what are you exhibiting? Because that's what you believe in. Skip on down to verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, which we already just told you you are in Christ, if, you're, if you've appropriated this, if appropriated forgiveness, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Well, when did that happen? When did it happen? 1,991 years ago. It, did, it, just, it didn't happen back in 1993. It happened 1,991 years ago. Verse 18, it says, all this is from God. Who in the flip are we to say it ain't? We're going to put ourselves back on the throne? God says he done the work. He said all of it's from him. We didn't have to do anything for it. My Bible tells me all I got to do is believe it by faith. Romans chapter 10 tells me if I believe it by faith, confess it with my mouth, believe it in my heart, I will be condemned? No, saved. And if I'm saved, I'm in Christ. 
And if I'm in Christ, it's a work of God. And if it's a work of God, can I screw it up? That's for a whole different thing. I don't want to jump off that deep end tonight. All this is from God, who through Christ Jesus reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is the, the important part of why I even went in, in, in this, for this series in this area. The cross of Christ is very known to c Christians, you know, and, and we should know all the benefits of the cross of Christ. But hear me, mortal life is an apostolic hub. We're very serious about taking this region for Christ. But hear me, we can't take the region for Christ if the people that go to mortal life are all bent up and not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they're more worried about not believing the gospel of Jesus Christ than believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ than go and share in it. Because when we believe it, then we will share it. Because when you go pray for that person and, you know, they're in a wheelchair and you want to pray for them to come out of the wheelchair, but you're still second guessing whether you're even saved. Or because of that sin that you did 12 years ago has been paid for yet. Has it been paid for? When? 1,991 years ago, give or take a few years, depending on who you read. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Christ reconciled the entire world. If you've received it, you've got it. Quit second-guessing yourself and move on. Quit being double-minded and move on. Get a hold of this ministry of reconciliation that he's, he's commanded you, quite frankly. He didn't save you to, to be off and, you know, go to church mode and live, the rest of you, live your life for you. What, what did that verse say back in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20? What did that, what was that? Right? I, I, I think it said something. Let me find it real quick here. I can't find it. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Oh. But Christ who lives in me. Is Christ living in you? Is he? If you're saved, he is. If you're saved, he is. What are you exhibiting? What we have to understand is that, guess what? These, these ain't man, mine. They're God's. These, they're not mine. They're God's. These lungs, they're not mine. They're God's. These lips, they're God's. They're Christ's. What's coming out of my mouth? Am I, am I uh, feeding life or death? Right? Brandon did, a, uh, I think, a sermon on that a little while ago. Right? Knowing, knowing whose we are, knowing whose life we're living. Man, I don't have time, but I got to go here real quick. In Romans chapter 6, and it's a familiar passage of scripture to all of us, but you know, in verse 1 it says, What shall we say then? Uh, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Right? Because all sins have been paid for. Are we to continue in sin? Hey, Amen. They've been paid for. So, whoo. Let's go do this thing. What's, I mean, Paul is so repulsed at the idea that he wants to puke. And you should too. He says, no, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? That sin is the noun. We died to it because it was nailed to the cross with Christ 1,991 years ago. When are you going to start appropriating the cross of Christ into your life? When are you going to start believing the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
Hear me. The gospel of Jesus Christ, yes, all of our sins are covered and paid for. And, and however you want to communicate it, it's done. The job is done. Christ took care of sin. It has no reign over your life. But you know what? If you're going to still continue to present your members to unrighteousness, guess what you're going to get? Unrighteousness, which leads to death and destruction. And it could be physical death, depending on our dispositions. And so Paul's telling us here in Romans chapter 6, well, let me just read it and we'll, we'll, we'll close up and, and pick it up next week. He says, well, so, so what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who, li who died to sin still live in it? It's a great question. The answer to the question is unbelief. Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So when were you baptized into his death? 1,991 years ago. You were baptized into his death. And so the last baptism I did, or, or no, no, I, did, I did not do this baptism. The last time I, ba I witnessed a baptism, those two people happen to be in the room right now. And so the moment they went under the water, they appropriated the death of Christ in their life. It was a prophetic proclamation that it was done. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into, the, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. All that happened 1,991 years ago. It's done. Why are you continuing to struggle so bad? Probably the same reason why I did. I wasn't believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wasn't believing the work of the cross. The work of the cross was done. Jesus did, doesn't come back and get back up on the cross. He did it once for all. He did it once for all. You can believe something else. But it's not God's word. Verse 5, it says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has, di has, has been set free from sin. Great time to ask the question, have you died? Have you died? Man, I only see one person shaking their head yes. Y'all need to get saved. If you're saved, you've all died. Every last one of you have died 1,991 years ago. Are you going to believe what Christ did on the cross? Or are you going to put yourself above that and say, oh, it didn't work for me? Would you want him to come back down and crawl up on the cross again? Take that beating? Verse 8, he says, Now, if we have died with Christ, we also believe that we also live with him. For we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death has no longer a dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Oh. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's the thing. Do you know this? Do you know it? Not just intellectually where we've just read it in the Bible, but do you know it? Has it been revealed to you? Yeah, it's been revealed to you by the Logos word. But it hasn't been revealed to you by the Rhema yet. 
And if not, that would be a great prayer. That would be a great prayer. But not pray, Lord, kill me. You've already been killed. How about starting to praise him because he did? How about starting to praise him that he paid the price for all your sins by the blood of the Lamb? How about starting to praise him because you were killed 1,991 years ago? How about praising him because it's there for your taking? All you got to do is appropriate it in your life. Friends, this is where the victory, the abundant life that, that Christ talks about is right here, is believing in what Christ did on the cross. Because he took, he took it all. Everything was done on the cross, and it was done by him. Not one of us can boast. Not one of us can say, uh, the only thing that we can say is we grabbed a hold of it by faith. That's what we can say. So if it was a work of God, you can't screw it up. I refuse to believe, and I don't see it in here. But live for God. Because what did it say? He died to sin so that he could live for God. That's us. Are you living for God? Is God living through you? Or are you getting a check mark on a Saturday night and going on about it? Because, man, you get to sleep in because Sunday, I had my church on Saturday night. It's a challenging, this is a, this is a challenging series. Because it really begins to really hit you in the solar plexus of what you believe and what you don't believe about the Word of God. So how do we end this thing? Well, I think the best way to end it is if you'll stand to your feet. Marley, do you got any little bit of music back there? And here's the thing, you know, only you know where you are. I don't know where you are. Hopefully everyone in the room has already given their life to Christ. If you haven't, I would, I would, I would, I would encourage you to, to get the free gift. It's a free gift that costs Christ everything. And guess what? It's gonna cost you everything too, because then you'll die. But that's the very thing that needs to happen. You need to die. And if you're not dead today and you're saying that you're a believer in Christ, stop it. You're dead. So you may want to just, in your own spirit, however you want to, you may just want to thank him. You want to, may, may want to thank him and praise him for the blood that was shed on the cross. You, want to, you may want to thank him and praise him that Christ took not only your sins to the cross, but he took your sin as an identity to the cross. That identity, you no longer have an identity, identity of a sinner. Oh, you still may sin, but that's not your identity. That sinner is dead. It died 1,900 and 91 years ago. Appropriate it in your life. Ask the Lord, Lord, I don't even know how to do that, but that's what I want. I praise you for it. I praise you for it. I praise you for it. The more praise that we give him for what he done on the cross, guess what? The more we appropriate what he done in our lives. That's how this gig works. That's how it works. And so, I'm going to close in prayer. If you need to continue to do business with the Lord, we're going to be up here. If you need more prayer, we'll be able to be up here. It, it, you don't have to leave, but here's what you do. What I do encourage you to do, do the business you need to do with the Lord. Give him glory, give him praise, and give him honor tonight.
for all that he did on that cross 1,991 years ago. So Heavenly Father, Lord, I just I thank you, Father God. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, specifically Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross so long ago. I thank you for the shed blood that paid for each and every sin, for every and all sin of the world you paid for. I thank you for that, Lord. And I appropriated it in my life. And I pray in Jesus' name that, that the people in the room would appropriate it in their life. Jesus, I thank you that you took not only my sins, but my identity as a sinner to the cross with you. I thank you, Lord, that you killed me, that I died with you on that cross. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I give you praise. I give you honor. I give you glory tonight. For I am dead. And that you now live through me and the people in this room that have given their life to you. Lord. And so, Lord, as we leave this place, I pray that your face would shine upon each one of us, Lord, that we would truly begin to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ in our life, Lord, so that we would be empowered to go out and share the gospel with each and every person that we come in contact with, Lord. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, declaring that this region is yours in Jesus' name. We declare that your goodness will reign in Jesus' name. That your goodness will not only reign in our lives, but in the lives of the people of the center of influence that are in our, in our center of influence in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, go with us now as we leave this place. Shine your face upon us, Jesus. Give us a continual sense of your presence in our life, Lord, for your glory and yours alone. In Jesus' name, amen.